All righty. Well, welcome back to the Ultrasound Grand Rounds this week. I am pretty excited for this week for a number of reasons. Um, first reason is this is the last Grand Rounds that we're doing of the calendar year 2023, which means we have done a ton of interesting topics over the course of the last 12 months. If you want to go back and see any of those kind of refresh on things, definitely go over to the YouTube channel and hit that up and um, take a look at kind of what we got going, going on over there. Metro Health emergency ultrasound on youtube uh give us a like a follow a subscribe um share it with your friends thumbs up all the good stuff kind of feeds the algorithm helps us out a lot but today as kind of the last lecture that we're going to give for the year i have another special guest with us uh in the studio today and i'm really really excited uh for where this conversation is going to lead we have a uh, dr james persky one of our vascular surgeons here today and we're going to talk a lot about uh, DVT ultrasound and when we need to think about DVTs, particularly in the iliofemoral region, where which was we kind of where we left off um, in our last talk. And so if you remember back several months ago, we did a lecture about May Therner syndrome. And what was interesting is we had a number of people who came online and said, hey, I've, I've heard about this thing. Thank you for talking about it. And so I wanted to kind of use that as a, a way of kind of getting into this topic and talking a little bit more about iliofemoral DVTs. And I think we're going to be um, all benefited today and, and find this really interesting. So with that said, what I'd like to do as we get started is just to dive into a quick recap from last week. And I got Dr. Persky here with me. We're going to ask some questions and, and have a really good conversation. So again, this is just a reminder from, from our previous lecture of kind of what May Therner syndrome is. Um, by definition, it's a uh, venous outflow obstruction due to extrinsic compression of that iliocaval territory, right? And so maybe pictures would do a little bit better justice to this thing. So if we have our aorta coming down from, you know, from above, right? We talked about the aorta ultrasound uh, a couple of weeks ago, but as we have that aorta coming down, it's going to divide into the iliac arteries and those got to go left and right. And to get over to you know, one side, the right iliac artery is going to cross over the left iliac vein. And so what can happen in some of these patients is that little bridge, right, can cause some extrinsic compression of that left iliac vein. And that can be the nidus uh, for some thrombosis. And we can see people who come in with um, left lower extremity DVTs due to this syndrome. And so here's an example um, from Radiopedia of just a CT scan where we can see a little bit of that compression. And again, maybe it's a little bit more self-evident here you can see in that venous phased um ct scan a little bit of that compression from that right iliac artery um, and if you want to look at like angiography here's another example where we can see kind of that compression and so what we identified uh in that previous lecture and obviously for the whole thing go back to youtube check it out it's on there um but we've identified there's a number of risk factors or you know things that kind of get us into this whole concept of um, May Thurner syndrome. And the risk factors are, you know, female, pregnant, postpartum, maybe in somewhere in you know, your second to fourth decade. Um, and then other kind of patient factors, you know, are dehydrated, hypercoagulable, things like that. Um, to the point where if you're coming in with these recurrent left lower extremity DVTs, this is something that that ought to be on your your differential things to consider, at least, you know, is this specific entity or is there like a iliofemoral type DVT that we needed to, to think about in the ED, right? Um, we talked a little bit about the management, at least as per what up to date guidelines were for um, for May Therner syndrome, and hopefully we we'll get a little bit more into some of the the techniques that are available to us with um, with vascular surgery. I know Dr. Persky and I were talking a little offline before we got started here, and there's a lot of new things that have come out and a lot of new ways of of managing this that may not be in kind of the traditional kind of what we see um, listed here. But where I wanted to go a little bit on the front end is just to remind ourselves just to touch about vascular ultrasound, because that's really going to be the not the hook per se, I guess maybe it's the hook, but the thing that gets us into this whole idea of May Therner syndrome, or not May Therner syndrome, but like DVT ultrasound is going to get us into this whole iliofemoral um, idea. So the workup of, of these things, remember um, veins typically have three categories sonographically. They tend to be anechoic. I mean, blood vessels tend to be anechoic unless you have that really, really slow flow that we've we've seen in previous lectures. They tend to be thin walled compared to their arterial companions, which have the thicker, uh, more developed arterial wall. Right. And they also tend to be compressible because they're a lower um, pressure system. Right. So you obviously don't have the high pressure 
you know, system of the of the arterial side, it's kind of a lower pressure return. And so when you apply a, a small to modest amount of pressure to that area, the vein is going to tend to collapse first. And I, I know we can come up with a whole bunch of nuances and, and ways that we can think of different scenarios where that wouldn't be the case. Um, but in general, for the vast majority of your patients, right, when you um, apply a small amount of pressure focally to that area, the vein is going to collapse first. And then if you apply, you know, way too much, obviously, the artery is going to collapse as well. So when we violate these three principles, right, um, then we have to ask ourselves, why is that violation happening? Because there's something going on there and maybe stated a little bit differently and probably a little bit more eloquently when you have a DVT, it's going to violate one or more of these principles, right? You're going to either not have something that's anechoic. Obviously, the wall is not going to change per se, unless it's a chronic DVT adhered to the wall, um, but it's also not going to be compressible. And so, for example, here's a, a short and long axis of a DVT, and it shows that, remember, those three different criteria, thin wall, okay, fine, we're on the right vessel. Is it anechoic? No, there's something in there, right? And then if we compress on that, we'll see that the walls, the two walls of that vein will not collapse and touch one another. They're going to collapse and touch that thrombus, right? And so there's something that's preventing those walls from collapsing. And that's going to be the primary thing that we do as we evaluate whether or not this patient has a DVT. And obviously, there's a lot of Doppler techniques that come into play, too. But this is the, the bread and butter of vascular ultrasound in the ED that's going to get us to that point of, hmm, there's something going on here. I need to dig into this further. Um, and one of the points that we made last time is this whole idea of finding the, the leading edge. Um, and so when you find this DVT, you scan as far proximal as you can go to see if you can find that leading edge to give you an idea of how extensive this is. Because yes, making the diagnosis um, is, is one thing, right? Because then we can get the patient started in therapy, but also knowing more about that diagnosis, knowing the extent of that diagnosis can be super helpful as hopefully we'll see later today because we have some colleagues in the hospital that have a lot of cool tricks and tools that can be deployed in the right setting um, and so the question then is, do we need to do more than just put them on some blood thinner and send them home, right? And so hopefully over the course of this next hour, we can kind of answer some of those questions uh, for us. Um, the last thing we talked about in that previous lecture is kind of a hint at how to get at this iliofemoral DVT idea with ultrasound. And we talked about how normally you have some, some respiratory phasicity uh, of that, that ultrasound. And if you have an obstruction in that left renal vein that you or not the left renal vein, the left iliac vein that you may not see directly, it could theoretically blunt the flow more distally. Um, and so if we see a blunted flow compared to the other side, then we have to at least ask ourselves, could there be an obstruction now sensitivity specificity? Yeah, probably not going to be the top test you can do but it can give you the hint of there's something going on here that I need to investigate further, as opposed to just seeing that normal physicity and saying, I'm less concerned. Again, does it completely rule it out? No, probably not, but it's can be a helpful tool in our tool chest. And so here's an example of that, um, that respiratory phasicity um, in, you know, in this proximal proximal vein here. Uh, so with that being said, what I'd like to do is move on to uh, some questions specifically about, you know, maybe May Thurner syndrome and iliofemoral DVTs in particular. Um, but with that, I'd like to bring on our guest um, and have you meet Dr. Persky. So we're going to cut on over to Dr. Persky. So thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate you being here. Yeah. So as we get started, um, maybe just give us a little bit of a, an understanding of you. Like we've we've had some guests on before um, and we have obviously our audience of Grand Rounds people here. Um, but just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you know, have, how long have you been here and where do you train and what do you do? I'm uh, a native Northeastern Ohioan from uh, Shaker. Um, spent some time away undergrad at Stanford and then came back to go to med school at Case. I did, you know, I'm old enough that to get boarded in vascular surgery, which I am, I had to get boarded in general surgery first. So I did my five years of general surgery and then uh, a two year vascular surgery uh, fellowship at the University of Cincinnati. Subsequent to all the training, uh, it's a little bit topsy-turvy my career. Uh, one year at uh, university in sort of the department of surgery, which was not a good fit for me. And then I did 20 plus years private practice, which is 
I think I learned more in my first year in private practice than I did in seven years of training. But that said, um, <clears throat> about eight years ago, I started to take call here as a favor to uh, Brandon Patterson and Chris Brandt. At the time, the division was a little bit um, overwhelmed. They had locums uh, coverage, which is never without a base of regular people here all the time is not great. Um, so I took some weekend call and realized, you know, I could do the trauma, which I, you know, in private practice, the management of trauma is sent that to Metro. Well, now I'm the receiving end, but I, I knew what I was doing and had a lot of fun with the residents and the students. And, um, when, uh, you know, they basically parlayed that they request, they asked me if I wanted to stay on and, and I just stopped, uh, ended my pra private practice and came here. So that's kind of how I got here. And it's very, been very enjoyable, um, very invigorating. The residents are, are good. They're hungry. They want to learn. And, and so do the students. And it's, it's been a lot of fun for me and really sort of recaptured that joie de vivre that uh, you know as, as a late stage surgeon so that, that's been really good well good really good um well i know i've over the course of my time here um we've consulted vascular a number of times and so your name has always been on the the bottom of the note you know like case discussed with dr persky um so it's <laughs> yeah. now finally we great hope. to actually have you <laughs> have you here and and um and to kind of meet face and untalk face to face so um but with that said i think we got into this today because we had a number of people who were, um, you know, who responded very favorably to the original um, lecture that we did. I I thought I was talking about just some esoteric random thing. And then people are like, yeah, I got me Turner syndrome. You know, I'm glad you like talked about this. And so it kind of got me interested uh, to talk a little bit more and kind of dig into the next steps. Cause I've seen a number of patients in the department where, um, as the person who does the ultrasound, um, you know, I can see there's something a little bit more than just a, it's just an average DVT, right? Mm -hmm. We should probably dig in a little bit further. And so maybe to kind of help guide and direct, you know, our group, and then maybe all those who are listening, kind of when do we need to escalate things? And so I guess the first question that I had um, is when we have a patient with a DVT, and I mentioned that was specifically May Thurner's is left-sided, um, at least classically, but maybe if we want to broaden up to this whole idea of, you know, iliofemoral DVTs, I know you and I have talked about that offline. Um, when should we as frontline providers start getting worried that there's something more than just the average one in the middle? Yeah, you got a DVT. Here's your DOAC. Have a nice day. Like, when should we start thinking about this and, and really start reaching out to you guys? Well, I think, you you know, your preliminary introduction identified a few important things. We're going to add a couple of things. One, it's not always left-sided DVT. If you think of the anatomy, the internal iliac arteries also bilaterally also cross over the iliac vein, and that can be another source of mechanical compression from the artery, which is what May Thurner is. So it doesn't always have to be left side. I th the other physical finding is you're going to see significant edema when it's iliofemoral. A fem pop, femoral popliteal DVT is you're you know easy to see we're gonna but it's not gonna be as dramatically swollen a, as an iliofemoral DVT. I think the major swelling that 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 we've we've mentioned and then the ultrasound findings the picking up an iliac DVT iliac vein DVT is is not that easy because the probe really you know you can have bowel gas which obscures the vein and will interfere with the Doppler signal. And and so you may not see the vein as good as you want to, to really identify the ultrasound, ultrasound criteria for a DVT, thrombus or failure to compress. Mm -hmm. But you will see the loss of the, the respiratory variation of flow. And that may be your clue that with the swelling, the loss of that, that this is somebody we're not going to give send home immediately because we really we have several different treatments uh modalities but we do need to not let the dvt become chronic so that might be somebody with the swelling you're going to at least put on lovenox and do additional imaging either via ct venography or even better is um you know take somebody to the cath lab either by interventional radiology our service or 
You know, we have some cardiologists who also treat it, and we can really identify uh, and treat at the same time. Gotcha. So DVT was significant edema. Um, yeah. Do you think there's a role of like identifying the leading edge? Like if you can find here's a leading edge and it cuts off and I have open vessel proximal to that, then I don't have to worry about this. Or is this something where like, even if I got that edema, I should probably well, dig may, a little further. You, have, you know, something in the history may be critical for you. You may have somebody at some point, they had a filter and now they're coming in with leg swelling. So you do have to tie other factors in. I'm not as concerned about finding the lead, leading edge necessarily. Sure. Um, you you may be surprised. The very first case that I personally treated here for for leg edema with DVT, his, his cava was thrombosed from a remote IVC filter. So part of you know, there's a number of components to to treating this. A is, but it all starts with you know the history and then identifying what the problem is. Sure. And I guess maybe one other question um, on this vein before we kind of move, build from here is like. What would you consider to be significant edema? I mean, obviously the the clinical story of a DVT is pain and swelling. So there's going to be some edema in most patients, but how much would you say this is going to be significant? I think when the thigh is really pretty swollen, that that concerns me. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Um, and so once, okay, so we've identified the patient. We've said, okay, this patient, we're, we're worried, right? There's something I need to dig into more. Um, from our perspective, from the ED perspective, what would be the next best thing for us to to do? I, I mean, maybe consult is the right answer, but like, what would be the next best thing to do to kind of set you up for that? You know, you know that. I think you know question. identifying that a it's ilio you know probable iliofemoral DVT. You could get a CT venography, or you can just call the vascular surgery service and say we're concerned iliofemoral. We don't want to lose the opportunity to treat. And, you know, our patient population, sometimes, you know, the discharge is the last you see them for a while. And that turns a, an acute problem into a chronic much harder to treat. So I, I wouldn't have any issue, you know, calling the, one of the consulting services. And they made, we, you know, depending on who's on call and what their comfort level is with the management, the endovascular management of this problem uh, would really dictate what's going to happen. I wouldn't consider it a failure if, you know, you guys couldn't manage the whole thing yourself. I mean, the number of toys that we have now to treat this, it's not just, I mean, I remember as a medical student, um, my intern who I was taking call with, she got a, she got an admission for an acute DVT and she, you know, it was actually, it was he just kind of went wild. It was sort of salt into the wound. And Chief Ren says, come on, Mark, you know, just put him on heparin, five days, Coumadin, no big deal. You know, those days are way over. Those are, I mean, the DOACs have revolution. That's a, that paradigm of treatment is revolution. dies DVT. I'll bet yeah. you a, a member of admits for DVT are probably, I don't know, 10% of what they were at some point, probably. Oh, yeah. I mean, even in, I mean, I'm not brand new at this thing, but I've also not been doing this for nearly as long as a lot of my colleagues here. And over my time of practicing medicine, I mean, our practice patterns have changed dramatically. Oh, everybody's, yeah. It mean, used to even, be. You know, even PEs don't automatically get oh, yeah. it anymore. I, re I remember a, when I was with the university, I admitted a young guy with a traveling, D, a traveler's PE. Yeah. And he was pissed. I said, you know, I just want to be safe, you know, because we want to make sure you don't have right heart strain and things like that. But even the PEs and the major DVTs, we we can treat those acutely and and relieve the clot burden, which is what the goal of therapy is now. We're not we're not stopping anticoagulation, but we're no longer relying on the body's fibrinolytic system to dissolve the clot, which can take months. So maybe let's let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so we have a, a DVT, right? More than run a mill, iliofem, yeah. very, very like whole leg, something like that. Uh, yeah. Obviously we want to prevent the PE because we spent, we focus a lot on, you know, less on the DVT and more on like, uh, oh, this thing could kill you with yeah. the PE. Cause that's, that's where our worry is, right? Right. Um, but dig into a little bit more about the what happens if we don't treat the DVT. Like, 
Uh, well, tell me a little bit more about the post phlebotic syndrome. So we talked about it a little bit last time, but really haven't dug into. We don't think a ton about that. That's obviously the holy grail of, of deep vein thrombosis is minimizing the long term sequelae of the blood clot, and that's eliminating the post phlebotic syndrome. You know, there's a, about a hundred thousand of those per year that develop that. It can happen, you know, five to ten years after the initial blood clot. And, you know, it's it's a, a vein that's become diseased. The valves no longer work. They have so they have chronic swelling, they have venous hypertension. And, you know, over time, you know, they may show chronic swelling, they may show some varicose veins, but they can also show you know, severe discoloration of the skin and eventual ulceration of the ankle. And these ulcers, these venous ulcers, which are related to venous hypertension from the blood, initial blood clot, you know, that's not that's not the sore that you got as a kid when you scraped your knee on the playground. That, you know, it goes away in two weeks. These sores can stay there for years. They're very hard to treat and very painful, very frustrating for everybody. So we've we've, you know, that's really the goal. And obviously, PE is part of that. And the whole kind of venous thrombus PE paradigm with the DOAX and now with endovascular management, that really, it's it's a whole new area of vascular disease that previously, what did we do for this problem? We gave them medicine. You know, and, and now we actually have safe, effective treatment, very expensive. <laughs> yeah. That's, but it, you know, if, if you're saving, you know, you're say you're spending on the front end versus the tail end, the tail end savings is frequent hospitalizations for infection, sores that don't heal, patients coming to clinic, getting wound care, spending thou you know, the system is spending thousands of dollars to take care of a problem that potentially uh, I'm not even going to say potentially could have been prevented. You may not be able to prevent the post the the severity of the post phlebitic. You no, know, you you may not be able to prevent the presence of the post phlebitic syndrome, but you can minimize the severity and minimize the wound care aspect of it, and really allow you know the patient population that has this problem to maintain their independence and and functionality. I think that's. I mean, that's a huge point to make. Um, I mean, there's an <laughs> A number of different directions that could go like you know sometimes the the whole idea of you know uh i get you can say it a number of different ways like you cry once like you cry on the front end with a little bit of expenditure or you cry on the back end you know um or you know say, you spend a little bit to save a lot you know um but even like for us you know, becoming very practical in the emergency department um you know we oftentimes focus so much on what's going to kill them now or or affect their morbidity now um, and, and less so on the second, third, fourth, and fifth order consequences, um, kind of leave that to the, the primary care side of the world. But I think what we're seeing, um, and I don't know where this culture shift is coming, it's probably multifactorial, but we're definitely seeing a lot more primary care in the ED. And so <laughs> it's pushing us outside of our little, our uh, comfort zone and our wheelhouse a little bit, but, you know, patients are coming to us kind of you're the prize. Yes. Yeah. It's, the it's, wound. I've got a wound and it's, yeah, it, it's, they can't it, get to the wound clinic. They can't get to us. Exactly. Very, Sometimes we're the here. most available physician. And so having that knowledge of like, this is the goal, right. Um, of what we're doing is really helpful. In fact, we were talking about this uh, a little bit ago, um, about this idea of mission strategy and tactics, right? And so the mission is to do, you know, prevent this post phlebotic syndrome so that the patient could have reduced morbidity down the road. And then our strategies and our tactics then follow. And so um, maybe just help us understand um, a little bit about, you know, in the strategy side, we can start big picture and then kind of filter down to very granular stuff. We have this patient with a thrombus. It's an extensive thrombus, right? We know the mission. We're, we're trying to prevent the PE from happening, obviously. We're trying to prevent the post phlebotic syndrome from, from happening. So what's the strategy in terms of, of taking these, like prevent further buildup, you know, lyse them, kind of clot okay. dissolution, like help okay. us with that part. So, so the, the clot's there. The strategy at this point is how quickly can we remove the clot? And you mentioned thrombolytics. And it's historically, it's been a very good approach. Mm -hmm. The key is you've got to get a catheter that can lace the clot and, the, and then infuse the thrombolytic into the clot. 
What's the downside? Well, a certain percent of patients have to leave. Yeah. It's a thrombolytic. And, you know, the, the administration and the accountants just hate to see that 72 hour lytic infusion. That's mm -hmm. expensive. Yeah. Okay. And it doesn't always work, by the way. A crime, you know, one of the things that where you're going to be a value is identifying this is an acute problem. Mm -hmm. We do better with our lytics when it's acute. Okay. So that's, that's very important. Your, your role in this is, yeah, this, this looks real to us, or, you know, we've got strong ultrasound evidence. It's a fresh clot mm -hmm. because we can treat that a lot easier. So removal of clot burden is yeah, kind of like, I, I guess the strategy. Yeah. So, um, Digging into a little bit of the tactics, then um, you know, we mentioned thrombolytics, how they, you know, have historically been kind of the thing. I mean, when I did the a little bit of digging on the previous lecture, I was looking up to up to date as to okay, you know, how does May Thurner syndrome treated, right? And it said thrombolytics, um, you know, so that's been one of the options. But obviously, you mentioned a lot more things that are coming out in the market. So tell us a little bit about like, where's the market gone in the last, you know, five, 10 years to the point, like if someone comes in with this swollen been, leg, what can we do for them? There's been three key um, developments that have opened up this area. The most important thing is the ability to accurately identify the problem. Ultrasound is better. It's quicker. More people can do it. But not only just transcutaneous ultrasound, treatment can be, should be, it, it's mandatory you have to have intravascular ultrasound. It's, um, it's, a, it's a device, we're looking at the vein in real time and we can see and we can measure the stenotic area. We can go through the area where the artery is pinching the vein and we can measure, you know, with the clot removed, we can measure exactly what the disease, the wall of the vein looks like, what the percent of the stenosis is, and then we can treat it. It's not enough. Veins are different than arteries. You can't do an angioplasty and expect any results, but you can deploy a stent. And we now have dedicated venous stents, which is it's a whole new, between intravascular ultrasound, dedicated venous stents, and the ability ability to bring the patient back if there's a problem and quickly treat it it's a game changer. This whole area, when I started, you know what we did for these patients? Compression wraps. And if they had an ulcer, they got a new and a boot. And that was it. And I can remember, you see these patients, they would had a circumferential full thickness sore on their calf from a remote DVT. And you'd, be, you know, you'd see them for five years. And, you know, it always looked pink and red, but it never healed. And then you identify that you've got a diseased outflow. I mean, you, you know, the, the flow into the vena cava looks like an upside down Y. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, these patients with disease, there's no Y. It's to obliterate it from, a, from the DVT that was never fully, the body never lysed it due to the chronicity. So you now you can, you, can, you can remove the disease. You get to a point where you have a reasonable channel, and then you can stent it open. And those stents work. And the DOAX work. So it's it's really, um, you know, new medication, new toys, new stents, eye, intravascular ultrasound. It's a game changer. There's There are vascular surgeons um, at, both at the clinic. You, they've, they've, uh, that's all they treat now. It's a whole, it's a specialty area. Like, you know, you, know, you talk about, um, I only, you know, we have an aortic center. There's mm -hmm. pro programs that have a, a, a venous center. You know, it's varicose veins, but it's also, you know, you've got an occluded vena cava with a with a vena cava filter that's clotted. You got to get that out. Then you got to open the cava and, and it's doable now, though. So, so what type of a, a turnaround is that? Obviously, we see the patient, we consult you, you say, fine, you admit them to we, vascular. What, what are we looking at for inpatient timeline here? Uh, we can do that in a day, a day or two, obviously. We and then if we can't do it, we're going to give it to radiology. We, sure. It's not. It's it's. There's no turf bath. And maybe not like uh. You know, how quickly can you get it done? But like patient course, like there, they, there can be home ED day one zero. Hours. So they're back in two days. Yeah, with with no swelling. And we're going to have to be on a an or and you know we don't eliminate anticoagulation no, completely. The question, they're going to yeah. get three months still of a doac. Yeah, and then and then we'll reevaluate. But the stents work. They stay. You know. You, 
you think you should have high flow and you know how how can these they 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 are designed for for venous pathology and they stay open is there a you know timeline like working backwards you know there we see them at time zero in the ed but that's obviously not time pathology time zero so how much pathology time do you think um it's a very bad way of asking the question I, like, I mean, how quick can we get to them or, or, or um you know like how oh i gotta think of how to ask the question right but like if we catch them soon obviously things go well if it, if they come in late you know still are there treatable. are there time issues there that we need to worry about it's or still it's harder but still treatable um you're seeing the development of thrombectomy catheters we're getting away we talk about lysis lysis is expensive mm -hmm. I and mean, all the administrations all over the country you know they're not happy when somebody's getting 72 hours of lysis yeah and we have catheters which can speed that up but we now have catheters that are designed to suction suction out the clot not only in the iliac vein but we were talking about pulmonary emboli we have catheters that can travel up into the atrium into the pulmonary circulation and suction out the thrombus go to go to my favorite uh medical uh information site i.e x formerly known at twitter <laughs> yep. and you see cases all over the place i mean it's 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 doable and uh you know the issue is these things cost money they're expensive i mean we we're just talking with uh one of the device manufacturers about you know getting this suction thrombectomy catheter mm -hmm. here and yeah it's it's not you know a couple hundred bucks it's you know it's five figures <laughs> yeah. and 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 no you know that's just what endovascular is now it, it's obviously it's an economic it's good but it's expensive i mean it's the same thing with us in the ultrasound side these yeah, machines are not but cheap they, but they they work they're they're you know think about where think about diagnosing a you know dvt you know uh 25 years the ultrasound oh, yeah. was not as good the ultrasound machines are much better and you know we've got dedicated ultrasound techs too you mean you may struggle and maybe that's a better machine better you know who's holding the wand yeah you, you know point of care ultrasound's great but sometimes you know uh the the the, the tech who's you know that's all they do all day they yeah. do 40 a day or whatever yeah they're gonna, I think they might catch something that's a little bit of why I think we're having converse this conversation conversations like this because obviously us in the ED we do this you know we don't claim to be as you know skilled as a is a tech who devotes themselves solely to it, but we're going to pick these things up. And so what yeah. one of our goals is to say, okay, you found this now, you know, you need to know what you need to know and like the, the next step further. And so how do we educate our people and kind of what's the next step further? I, I so think I you think, guys can see more than, I think that you're, you'll be able to see the external iliac vein for sure. And I think if you see thrombus there, you've got your, you've made your case, but if you see loss of respiratory variation, strong suspicion. I mean, I think that's, you know, I think that's going to be a big um, tip for your consulting services. Gotcha. Um, so I guess maybe the next, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, so maybe a little bit of a repeat idea. Um, but the idea of, okay, we treat the iliofems with, you know, we tried the thrombolytics, you know, we're trying stenting, you know, let's say they have far other example, just a you know a pop dvt right we're not going to stent those we're not going to lice those so we're only stenting ilia iliofemoral and vena cava that's gonna be kind of my question is where along that spectrum of 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 the leg you know how far up would you kind of start considering these more aggressive and advanced techniques versus saying i think we're good just to do a doac and go home i think if i see fem, fem pop dvt doac elevate walk go home um we get dvts from doing some of our work on outpatient varicose veins and mm -hmm. those patients they have small calf dvts we we might give them a doac for a month and then say you're good yeah you know, i mean their act their ability you know what's what is the background of the dvt is it de novo out of the blue no risk factors that patient may get lice but they may be on doac forever somebody you know i had a colon resection two weeks ago i you know I got in the car for a long car ride and I got out my way that patient's you know you've got a reason to have it that they have to separate that out too gotcha you know? uh a couple specific questions about May Thurner syndrome and then maybe we'll kind of do a little bit of a recap just as we're getting yeah. towards the end of our our hour here Great. but um we talked about how 
May Thurner's is specifically that extrinsic compression of one vessel on another. Um, so help me understand like the the physics and the, the thrombus dynamics. Like does the th- the clot start from there and propagate or does it you have someone who developed a clot and that reduced flow prevents you know, flow, and then it, it is is a risk factor for development. Like, how does that work? Or do we know? Usually, endo. So the artery pulsating damages the vein wall. So that's the first part of Virchow's triad. Mm-hmm. So the clot starts there and propagates distally. Okay, to the point where does it stop? Hopefully, it does. It goes to where the profunda vein is emptying into the femoral vein. That's where it will. That's where it ends up. It doesn't travel into the whole leg or anything like that. Um, and that profunda vein is critical. That's something, you know, when you're, we can stent from the cava all the way to the groin and they stay open, but you can't cover that. That profemoral vein has to be open. That's very important for minimizing and correcting the swelling that, that you'll see and, and minimizing post phlebitic syndrome. So that's, the ability to treat is is really it can it's very extensive but you you don't you don't want to cross too far into the thigh because then then you're going to get in trouble so we're not we're not stenting or we're we might lice a clot or suction out a clot in the thigh Mm -hmm. because all of our approaches start sort of we have the patient lying on their stomach because it's very easy to access the popliteal vein, it's right behind the knee. It's, yeah. it's about an inch bolt out beneath the skin. So that allows us, if the clot is very extensive, i.e. from the knee all the way up, well, we get a wire through all that. Once the wire is there, we can either suction it out mm-hmm. or we can lice it. And then once we define the anatomy with the clot gone, that's where we use our IVUS. So it's treatment, it's IVUS. Ivis recognizes either the disease vein wall or the area stricture, and then we pick the appropriate size stent and the appropriate length. You got to be, it's, lytics are expensive, but they also are, they help. They work, they're they're synchronous with suctioning the clot out. Sometimes you can't suction it out. You need lytics to clean it up. Sometimes the lytics don't work, so you got to suction it. They work to, you have to be, you have to have both. And um, and and basically be comfortable. You know, you don't like if we look at the new toys. Okay, and I, I, that's no other way to describe. It. I think sure. there used to be one lytic catheter. Yeah. Okay, it was the angiogen. Well, now there's about eight. Okay, there used to be one suction catheter. There's 35 now. There's no way I'm going to know how to use all. I need to use one of each. Yeah. And that's what my goal is. And that, and I think when I speak with their cardiology colleagues who do some of this and the, you know, that's what they have to, we got to be comfortable and you have to know sort of what is safe and, and, and sort of tailor the, the treatment, you know, to the patient. Gotcha. Not everybody needs lytic and, and, and not everybody can, can be a candidate for, um, you know, all things. Some patients just, they're, they're not treatable. You have to recognize that and not, you know, try to do no harm. Well, let's try to land the plane here. Um, we've had, okay. it's been a very robust conversation. I I personally have learned a ton um, that's going to help kind of moving forward kind of in our practice. Um, but maybe just a little bit of recap. We've got patients in front of us. Um, they have a DVT. We've identified that by one means or another. Um, and it sounds like when we, we are going to involve you guys, when we have a concern for iliofem, yeah. mostly from a clinical standpoint of they have a profound degree of of um of swelling or edema yeah. in that leg um and at that point then we're going to be talking to you about what next best study you want probably some form of ct because we have that available Delay to us venography yeah. to make yes and then um, that 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 will clinch what's going on it doesn't give you the information to treat though gotcha and the information to treat is ibis yeah if with no ibis you can't do any of this and that that the development of intravascular ultrasound, which you know, I mean, it's 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 really come on in the last five or six years. I mean, previously, 
you, you, nobody used it. Yeah. So this is our challenge to all of the point of care ultrasound manufacturers is to get us a point of care IVIS machine. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> That'll be the next lot. Like that we're pretty cool. We're doing, uh, we've started with they're surface pretty, anatomy. Yeah. They're pretty, you know, they, the Phillips makes one we use and, and you go online and they have a whole textbook of here's what you're looking at, Dr. Person. <laughs> I'm not an expert at it. I, I'm, a, you know, and I've actually, tried i know that the head of interventional radiology dr benuto she she is interested in it yeah. so i try actually to to feed her the cases i think we're probably pushing the boundaries of the philosophy of point of care ultrasound that without, might but be, be... <laughs> I, I don't think you're going to treat it in the er and send them on their way but maybe you'll get a treat maybe you'll get a hybrid room in the ER. who knows you got to watch out for the ed docs we, we start doing things. but i think it's an interesting um you know, problem. I actually, you know, Mae Thurner, when I was, I never even heard of it till I was doing my training. And, and, but as, as our ability to diagnose has improved with IVIS, you're, you're hearing more, you know, there's more papers written about it. But I think yeah. if you did an historical review of the, of the Mae Thurner syndrome, you would see very little written about it until 95 or 2000. And it's the same thing with some other odd vascular problems. Like there's something called uh median arcuate ligament syndrome mm -hmm. okay you know nobody even thought it exists well now we have robotics we can get into that area of the abdomen and it's something like uh the nutcracker syndrome okay something weird yep but now you know what you, you're seeing people writing their case reports every month look at look what i did with this one now uh, you know they only obviously publish or write about the ones that work we're, yeah we're working <laughs> You know, you talk to some of the guys at, at the other places in town and you hear hear the horror stories. Yeah. <laughs> but there's no question. I mean, uh, advances in technology have, have really helped us on, you know, what's the price? It's, there's a price. But nevertheless, I think patient care has been improved significantly. Well, I think that's a great place to to kind of wrap things up, That'd you know, the um talking a little bit about this topic. I think we've exhausted the ED side and kind of gotten us to that next level that we're hoping to, and then yeah. uh, really opened our eyes to kind of what are some of the options available for patients beyond the doors of our department and kind of sometimes it's hard as the ED person to, you know, we call the console. I'm like, Hey, I'm sorry, this is a stupid console, but we got, you know, and, and just like, but to know, some of the thought process that goes behind the scenes, you know, with I you guys, when we bring you in, into I, these I, patients. I have a funny story about that. I, one of your residents who's out at the, one of the East side clinic hospitals, uh, he called me about, actually I ran into him on the tennis court. He said, Oh, you work at Metro. I go, yeah. He goes, you know, I called you at 3 AM once and you know what? A really nice guy. He came in. <laughs> we, we encourage that among our residents, be nice, come in. That's what we like. That was honestly some of the best, one of the, in my medical school training, now we're way off topic, but in one of my yeah. medical student tr school training, one of the best attendings that I rotated with was a pediatric surgeon for that exact reason. And I've to, I'm blanking on the guy's name. And so if you're listening, which you're probably not, I apologize, but <laughs> um, he made, he went over and above to make the point of being kind to the, the, the referring physicians and even to speak kindly of the referring physicians because he knew the market like he's like you know the pediatricians had three years of training i've had you know five years plus three um you know so i may be the expert on this thing but you know what they're sending me the patients and if they go back and say man that surgeon you sent me to is oh, a yeah. jerk like it doesn't help no, me and so no one in light <laughs> exactly so that stuck happy to help out that stuck with me is like always be that way yes, um for way for your go. patients and your colleagues so but hey thanks so much for joining us Thank today you for the invitation if you have anything other topics that you would like possible clarity on if i can provide it happy to help. oh you better be careful we'll get you back on um good, good to go yeah <laughs> so anyway hope you guys enjoyed that today um i really enjoyed having dr persky here and really kind of digging into this topic and learning more about it um but i think we're going to wrap it up here uh for this time and for this semester um as this is gonna be the last lecture from 2013 or 2013 what am i talking about 2023 uh, this will be available on the youtube channel here coming up um very shortly and then join us back for 2024 we got a whole bunch of stuff that's going to come up um after the the holiday season here i got a bunch of fun ideas uh where we're going to try to dig into various topics of bedside ultrasound in very practical uh ways that you may not have seen uh here before so give us a like share subscribe 
um, hit that thumbs up button. We definitely appreciate it. And with that said, let's open things up here. I know there's a few people on the call. Any questions for Dr. Persky uh, about vascular, uh, ultrasound, DVT ultrasound, or things to that effect? <laughs> 